Thompson. On the show today, we are talking with the team from the Neurodiversity in Education Coalition. Welcome to Property Matters. Welcome along to another Monday and a Monday where government's announcing lots of different things in the investment space. But we're going to take a pause this week and we'll pick that up next week with our real estate gurus. Uh, next week covering everything that's happening in the Bay of Plenty region. But we'll check in with the news with them as well. Because today we wanted to support um, something really different and something wonderful. So we have Matt and Katie Rose in from the Neurodiversity in Education Coalition. That is a mouthful. Thanks for giving that to a radio <laughs> host. Uh, welcome back, mate, Matt, and Thank welcome you. Katie Rose. Thank you. Good to be here. Great to have you both here. So before we go sort of deep diving into this, tell us a little bit about who you are. So Katie Rose, who are you? Um, <laughs> I'm part of the YNC, the Young Neurodiversity Champions. Um, the group itself is a group of like neurodiverse learners from all over New Zealand who are neurodiverse themselves and have experienced the struggles of being in an education system that doesn't support us. So we're all banding together to help change that for future generations. Okay. And can I be cheeky and ask how old you are and are you at school or uni or what are you doing? Um, I'm 18 years old now. Um, I'm going to Auckland University, University of Auckland, studying psychology, which I'm really interested in. It ties into neurodiversity pretty well. Um, and I'm really enjoying it so far. Brilliant. Now, Matt, you're no stranger to the show. We've had you on before and you work a lot behind the scenes for us. So uh, tell us a little bit about you and what's your link in here. Yeah, yeah. Well, firstly, thank you for having us today. It's great to come here and talk a little bit about the work we're doing. Um, yeah, so I've been here before. So I uh, day-to-day run my own digital growth agency. So working predominantly with impact-focused brands across the world that are really trying to make a change in the world and, and, and make a, a, a tangible difference that we can touch, smell, see, feel, that sort of thing. Um, and my link in here is uh, I've been working with the New Zealand Centre for Gifted Education for the last two and a half years or so. Um, predominantly working around the social digital sort of space, helping them with a number of different things around comms and all that sort of thing. And it was probably about a year and a half ago that uh, Justine and myself, the CEO of NZCGE, uh, we sat down and said, it's becoming a bit tiresome having us older generation, and I'm going to say that very broadly as older generation because I don't fit into either side. I'm somewhere in the middle at 24. Oh, so old. (laughs) Um, but, but it, it, it's time for us to, yeah. to stop being the voice and the face of these sorts of things. This is a youth, uh, a youth organisation. We're there to support young people. We need young people really at the forefront of that. So we looked to set up a group called the Young Neurodiversity Champions, which Katie just mentioned, and pre- uh, it started off as an idea to have them basically create a bit of a focus group of young people telling us what are we doing right, what are we doing wrong, where are the gaps, what really matters to you as a young person. And very quickly, uh, as we started that process, we reached out to all of the other neurodiverse organisations in New Zealand, so ADHD New Zealand, Dyslexia Foundation, Autism New Zealand and the countless hundreds of other organisations that are out there doing great work, uh, asking them to share, being very cheeky and saying, can you share this with your community and help us? And then very quickly that formed into the four kind of main neurodiverse organisations in New Zealand, the peak bodies being New Zealand Centre for Gifted Education, supporting gifted learners, ADHD New Zealand, Dyslexia Foundation and Autism New Zealand. And we jumped on a Zoom call. At the time, it was still just post-COVID. Everyone was doing Zoom. And sort of said, look, we're all, we're all fighting for the same change. We all want the same difference in New Zealand. We know where the gaps are. We know what works. But when we're advocating and when we're out there doing the work, we often look like we're competing against each other. Uh, but fundamentally, we're singing the same song sheet. So we said, what would it look like if the four organisations came together and formed a coalition and said, don't stop the work you're doing individually. That's very important for your communities. But when it comes to an education Mm. lens, why don't we come together and advocate collectively to government, corporate partners, um, schools and the like and and come in together? There's more power as a collective. So very quickly, we formed the Neurodiversity and Education Coalition. And my role within that is sort of a... I guess the word is project lead, conveyor. I sort of act as uh, as a third-party voice who's not one of the CEOs of the organisations who can kind of look a little bit more, I guess, um, from a bird's-eye view rather than coming in with any kind of agenda or anything like that um, and work very closely with all the organisations on delivery and 
everything involved in this organisation, which is very quickly becoming a behemoth. Yeah, brilliant. Uh, Katie Rose, and feel free to yeah. chip in, Matt. How, you know, to someone listening, how would you describe what neurodiversity or being neurodiverse is? I mean, Matt's just mentioned some agencies which have given us a, a mm. pretty big clue along the track, but it, it's so much broader than people realise. Um, when I think of neurodiversity, I think it's in the name. Like, our minds think very diversely. It's a different way of thinking. Like, um, for ADHD, you can't just label them, oh, they can't sit still. It's more mm. than that. It's the way they think. It's the way that they learn things because the current education system is only set for a volume of letters. It's like a sit down, you need to do this. And if you physically can't, because obviously you can't learn to be neurodiverse, mm. you're, you're born this way. It can be really, really hard to succeed. So I think it's definitely a way of thinking. Um, and it's a, literally a part of who you are. It's the way you are, the way you work, the way your brain's wired. So I think that's what it is. So, and feel free any time to say none of your business along the lines <laughs> of you. But, you know, you're here as a young ambassador. So I'm guessing your story is, is an important part of this journey. Can you talk me a little bit about your own journey in the education system and being neurodiverse, how did that work for you or play out for you? Um, so when I was younger, I didn't really have a good time in school, but this is also a common theme among most of our YNC champions. Like We all discovered that we're different through negative experiences in school, so we want to change that. Um, but I showed early signs of neurodiversity as a child. Um, I was like very overstimulated, overthinker, dealing with like sensory overload, um, and I think that my feelings were very amplified. And I took like I took everything too personally, so I knew I was <laughs> different in that way. Um, but I knew I also didn't fit in in school. Like even if it was the things I liked, the trends, I, I just wasn't interested in the same things. And I had a different way of learning like mm. I didn't there was there's always, always different roads there's always different paths to doing things and I didn't want to learn math this way or I didn't want to write English in that kind of tone and that's what got me in trouble I was like labeled and pushed aside and um undermined a bit and my other uh, teachers it's not entirely their fault because teachers themselves are not taught how to understand um or teach neurodiverse learners um but they didn't understand me and as a young kid going to school trying to like take in everything and learn for myself if my teacher doesn't know what's going on then it was harmful for me as well yeah and I like what you said before, you know, they're teaching to the mass numbers, mm. but that's not fair on the one person that wants to go, hey, don't forget me. Yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of the time, some neurodiverse learners are told, like, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. Why Why should you get focus among 30 other children? Um, but it's also more than that. Just because one kid is neurodiverse doesn't mean others aren't. Mm, there are some mm. hiding among the masses, masking a lot of the time. And when you grow up with that, it's gonna it's gonna come and bite you in the bum in the future. Mm. Like that's not a way to uh, live or grow up or, or support our young students. Have we got better, Matt, at identifying this, especially in our education system, or have we still got a lot to go? I have to, be, I have to choose my words carefully in case there's <laughs> any uh, principals or <laughs> government listening. Um, the narrative is shifting, mm. I think. So over the last 18 months, since I've been really head first in this space, the narrative is definitely shifting. Is it shifting fast enough? I'd say the answer is no. Um, there's some very clear correlations that we can be making towards uh, young neurodiverse individuals and the outcomes that they are expected to to. to to see, given the level of support that we have in the system. Now, I, I, as Katie Rose said, and I want to make this very clear, this is no fault of any one individual. Mm. Uh, any parent listening with neurodiverse kids, it's not your fault. Mm. Mm. Any educators, it's not your fault. Um, medical professionals, um, the justice system, it, it's a collective failure of a system. Mm. And I think, uh, you know, one of the big pieces of work that we're doing, and one of our core focuses actually is... The problem of uh, the, the failure of the system is the awareness of the problem. Right. Most people we talk to on the street, most people that we engage and, and communicate with, don't know what neurodiversity is. Mm. 
when you hear the term neurodiverse, you think, oh, you're that weird kid who sits in the corner and fiddles with his thumbs and struggles to speak or, you know, or you're the, the, the young woman who has way too much energy and you run around the room and you never do any work or we think of the very extremities, yeah. right? As we do with most things yeah, when yeah. you don't understand. We think of the far wide extremities of that one case of that one weird, and I say that with my, with my fingers moving, <laughs> that one weird kid in the corner at school, right? That's just not what neurodiversity is. Mm. So uh, without bombarding you with stats, a couple of kind of high-level ones to, to showcase the, the, the depth of this, we estimate, and I, and I use the word estimate quite likely because there has been no studies done in New Zealand that we're aware of that really quantify this problem. The, the data we take is a congregation from global data r- run through mathematical algorithms to quantify it back to New Zealand. So we estimate that one in five or 320,000 young people in New Zealand are neurodiverse. Of that, you would be lucky if 30 to 40% of them are diagnosed. The rest remain undiagnosed. You can imagine what that does, as Katie Rose mentioned, to the psyche of a young person who's labelled weird, odd, Mm. troublesome, annoying. So why are they not diagnosed? Where is the gap? Is is that that we as parents are not as the first step in this, recognising this? Because, uh, you know, surely we're raising children before they get to an education system or a health system. Yes, yes, to an extent. But the reason I don't put blame on parents is you weren't taught mm, what neurodiversity no. was. Mm. And even if you were, you weren't taught coping mechanisms or mm. strategies to deal with it or... Nobody is taught for these sorts of things, right? And we've seen it over, excuse to take it this angle, but we've seen it over the last sort of five, six years with um, the gender discussion, right? And we see a lot of all the sexuality discussions or anything like this. We often see the the older generations who have gone through a large num- period of their life not understanding, not knowing. It wasn't a thing. We didn't talk about it back then. And then overnight, we just expect them to completely understand what this is and fully adapt to it. Mm. There's no fault to anybody in here. It is purely a systematic problem that, like I've mentioned, the the awareness is just not there. We aren't running quality educational discussion explaining what neurodiversity really is. So Um, this is where the Coalition and Champions come in? Correct. So, Katie Rose, tell me a little bit, what is some of the work that you and your team and Matt's team is doing when it comes to both the Champions and the Coalition? Um, so I think last year what we did was, well, we had created a white paper that was Justine and Matt's doing, um, and we got to present that at Parliament to multiple parties and say, hey, we're here, this is kind of who we are, this is our story, and this is like what, this is the things that we would like changed in our education system, so in our law, so we're not leaving anyone out, and schools have to listen. How did that go, presenting that? Uh, honestly, it was nerve-wracking, but I think it went really well. We met so many people, we made some connections, and we got a really good um, response. Um, but I think we're making a new white paper this year, which Matt might speak upon later. Um, and another thing we did was uh, in Wellington Festival of the Future, where we held a store, a stall, and we were just educating everyone who went to this like leadership event. This is who we are. This is how to support us, and this is what neurodiversity is. But yeah, very very humble. Reaching yeah, they, yeah. They, these young champions have done a lot more than just that. <laughs> um, you know, from from a digital space, which is what I'm native with. These guys have reached well over a million people in their first year of work, which is absurd. That's a large number of people. Mm. Uh, more media than I've ever seen a new, what I'd call a new startup get off the ground. We're in every major publication you can imagine, TV, radio, newspapers. Um, Education Gazette. Yeah. They're very humble, Katie Rose. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you're getting out there and you're getting the message out there. What change are you noticing? or And I guess how are you measuring that? I think it's, um, I think we're in a really interesting time in general at the moment in the sense that young people's voice is becoming stronger and it's becoming more listened to. What I mean by that is, uh, I think back to when I was in high school, which was many moons ago now, six, seven years ago. Um, Very different space now in the sense that I feel young people have a lot more weight in conversation when they're at the table. 
Mm. The problem is getting them to the table, yeah. right? So, so our, our, our priority, and when I say our, I'm meaning the coalition side, our priority and most importance is placed on having our champions at the table in the discussion because we know when these guys tell their stories, rooms change. Mm. Um, and we've seen it. We've, we've, I, I had a discussion with somebody the other day who, prior to the work we did, had no idea what neurodiversity was mm. and refused to believe that things like ADHD were even a thing, mm. right? Oh, it's just another label you've given your kid. Mm. There's nothing wrong with them. Grow up, right? Now, after a year of seeing all the work they've done, messaged me the other day and said, hey, I just want to apologise. I had no idea this was actually even Brilliant. real. Love it. Um, so it's shifting. It's yeah. shifting. Slowly. Where would you like to see it go this year? Yeah, we've got a big roadmap this year. Uh, so... A few kind of key areas, and I'll raffle them off nice and quickly. Um, one is uh, we are releasing a new white paper this year. We'll be working on a new white paper around the state of the nation. Um, so collaborating with a number of organisations around uh, understanding where, where the nation currently sits. Funding in this space is incredibly poor. Um, you know, we've got some organisations that are literally running off the love of the people that run it. And I'm talking peak bodies of organisations in this country that receive zero dollars. Um, we're also working to quantify the impact that this is having on New Zealand, specifically in the corporate sector. So we know, for example, in Australia alone, on average, $20 billion, and I say that with a B, $20 billion is lost every year in economic value just in ADHD. None of the other, none of the other neurodiversities, just in yeah. ADHD. And it's predominantly from misdiagnosis or undiagnosis. Um, uh in California alone, so if you look at the US now, just in the state of California, they lose $12 billion a year in productivity due to undiagnosed dyslexia. Mm. That is one neurodiversity. We know, again, we know the kind of rough stats. ADHD is roughly 5% of, the, of, 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 of society. Dyslexia, 10%. Giftedness, 5%. Autism, 2 to 3%. Like, these are not small numbers. Right? If we were looking at this from an ethnicity point of view or a cultural point of view, emphasis would be placed on these. These are not minorities. These are serious players in our, in our society, and, and they're being forgotten mm. um, or pushed to the side. Um, we're doing another piece of work which we've been running for a while called Building a Neuroinclusive School. So we've partnered with a dozen schools around the country and provided them with a framework and a toolkit in order to make their schools neuroinclusive. Great. I'm not, and again, I'm not talking about build a whole new space yeah, or yeah. spend billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. These are very tangible, which we which we collaborated and actually built with the champions. These are tangible, ten to fifteen little check boxes that you can tick off throughout the year that will ensure young people going through the education system, like Katie did just a couple of years ago, are able to thrive and reach their potential. Um, which is incredibly important. We're also doing a piece of work, and I'll get the name right here. We're also doing a piece of work with uh, GUINZ, which is the Growing Up in New Zealand study, which we talked a little bit about off here, naughty of us, um, <laughs> which for those of you who don't know, it's, the, it's New Zealand's largest longitudinal study. So they've got just over 6,000 families um, with children born between 2009 and uh, 2010. And... Um, it's, it's the largest unique insight into developmental study New Zealand's ever had. We're doing a piece of work at, with them at the moment to learn more about neurodiverse children so that we can provide better education for families to go, these are the signs you should look out for in these age groups. This is when we tend to see things pop up. These are the issues we see. And I'm going to say the stat, which is a little bit saddening, but then I'll pass it back to you, Stephen, to quickly lighten the mood with Katie Rose. <laughs> um, the initial output that we've seen of that study so far, so this is just going off their statistics alone. This is n n with very little collaboration from the work we're doing. 15% of eight-year-old participants in the study were identified as neurodivergent. So 15%, that's already bigger than our one in five that we mm -hmm. estimate. 15% of these eight-year-olds. Here's the saddening stat. Already at eight years old, the neurodiverse group has significantly higher anxiety and depression and lower school satisfaction and quality of life than neurotypical children. Which in a country that is full of teenage suicide stats, that's of huge concern. And, and, and these numbers are echoed through. So there was a Canadian study done a few years ago that one in four women with ADHD will attempt to take their life at some point during their life. Mm. One in three autistic people are unemployed, right? 
that's a that that that's an ignorant stat. That is not a they can't do a job. Yeah. That is employers aren't willing to to make accommodation. Fifty percent, at least fifty percent of our prison inmates have dyslexia. Twenty five percent have ADHD. Right. When you're looking at some of these stats mm. and you can see common threads around depression, anxiety, prison, um, unemployment. At what point do we as a society say there has to be a common link here? Yeah. And it's clearly the fact that we aren't recognising that there's a problem. Um, so, yeah. You mentioned gifted a few times. Katie Rose, how would you describe sort of, I guess, you wouldn't want to call it a label, but, you know, that you have mentioned it a few times, that title of gifted. What makes someone gifted fit into the neurodiverse category? Um, well, I was diagnosed with giftedness uh, at the age of six. Um, on my actual form, it says that in one sort of section or um, one sort of academic variable like maths, uh, like um, visual spatial, I was in the 98th percentile. So I was super smart in this one year. But that is not what giftedness is. That is a part of it, but it's also, the like I said, the way you think. Um, it's sort of, it's really hard to explain. I usually take a while when I'm trying to get people take to understand your time. it. Take your time. Um, it also comes with other things, like um, like another overthinking, overbearing. Um, I might get overstimulated. I might just turn off completely. I can hyper-focus on things that I really, really enjoy, but I can also, if I'm not interested in something, it's just not going to get in my head and yeah. it's going to be like a war. I'm going to be useless to you. But I, like, it's good and bad, and it's, it's trying to balance those and understand that... Um, that it's giftedness is not being smart. It's part of neurodiversity and it's part of understanding how you work. I'm still understanding what giftedness means for myself because, of course, there's no definition that goes, oh, yeah, this is what you are. I was called a gifted visual mm-hmm. spatial learner. And so what I understand that is I see better in pictures. I love more creative things. Okay. I really suck at math. No, I'm kidding. You, <laughs> that's not what giftedness is. But I, there's, also, there's pros and there's, there's, there's challenges. I wouldn't say cons. Yeah. The, something really interesting you just said there, Katie, which I want to highlight, which is you're still working out what giftedness yeah. means mm-hmm. to you. And the reason I want to highlight that is no two neurodivergent people mm-hmm. are the same. Just because, Definitely. you know, person A has ADHD and person B has ADHD, that doesn't mean they have the same type. That doesn't mean they experience life the same. It's, again, I... I if, if, if everybody, so neurodiversity at a, at a core is, it's a brain-based difference, right? Mm-hmm. The way your brain is wired thinks, feels, perceives the world around them differently to a neurotypical individual, right? And that's often categorized at a very early young age of overthinking, um, you know, intense passion. So, um, you know, I've done some visits recently out to some of the NZCGE schools and, you know, you've got kids at the age of six who can name you every single boat in the harbour. <laughs> they are immensely passionate about that. Don't ask them to do their times tables. Yeah, right. I'll, I'll never forget once being in Dunedin and meeting this young man who's about eight and he studied road maps. Yep. And he, I, he, I was in Dunedin. That's where he lived. Yep. And he asked me where I lived in Auckland and he immediately, I said, Blockhouse Bay Road. And he said, oh, well, you'll need to get off at Waterview when you come off the end motorway and you'll need to go down Great North Road. And there you go. And I was just like, wow. So, so the perfect example Love which it. I can give on that is, um, as I mentioned, when most people think neurodiversity, they think the weird kid in the corner, mm. right? And, and I totally get it, right? Up until probably three, four years ago, I thought the same. But then if I said to you, the smartest people in the world, the people we consider savants, right? When you hear the word savant, you're like, mm. oh, that's the person who's like the world's greatest at one thing, right? Musical savants mm. that can play piano without even learning it or can do every time stab without even knowing how to speak. Like yeah. these levels of savant. Savant is... My, my, from, from as far as I'm aware, I'm pretty sure this is right, savant syndrome is on one far end of the spectrum of ASD, which is the autism spectrum dis, um, disorder spectrum. So it's not necessarily just the weird kid in the corner. It can also be the one that you go, wow, how are they even that smart? Mm. Right? So, it, And this is what I mean by it affects everybody in all walks of life. It is not one and the same. Every Yeah. Neurodiversity is very much, it, your brain is just wired differently. Yeah. Everybody's brain is wired differently. Hence the word diverse. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. So you've got um, applications open now for your next cohort. Can you yes. talk me through, if someone was to apply, what's their commitment? What's their involvement? What What's your year looks like? Um, last year, I'll look uh, because we're all from all over New Zealand, 
there's not really many opportunities for meetups, so when we do, we make it count. <laughs> um, but we meet. Uh, this might change, but we met regularly uh, weekly. So on a Monday, we would all zoom in um, and would have a goal. We'd say, okay, so what are we working on now? What's an issue? And we'd all like just blurt out what's going on. Like, oh my gosh, my teacher did this. Can you believe it? And then we'd go, okay, how are we going to change that? What is our next steps? And so that's how we developed um, our mm. goals and everything we want to work on this year. For example, our workshops. We want to get those out into the community. I can give you a little rundown if you'd go, like. Go for it. So um, we're working on a few workshops this year because a lot of us were wanting to make physical change. It's really hard recognizing the uh, difference in our communities but not being able to do anything. So we are uh, acknowledging that there's not much awareness. People don't know what's going on. Not, people may not believe it or understand how much of a big um, threat it poses to children or, or just learners in general. If you're a neurodiverse adult, you can still be struggling. Um, one of our workshops is our activator workshops. So this is um, one for when you are diagnosed or you think um, you might have some symptoms or you just want to understand more. And it's about educating um, and giving you support platforms because that's also something that we like. We like a place to go when you mm. want to understand how you think, how you are, how, you, how your mind ticks. Um, and it's also about embracing it and removing that stigma. It's not, you're not a weird kid. You, it's quite literally just how you are. Um, another one is Educate in Power, our E&E workshop. This is more for our uh, parents and teachers who want to learn more. It's um, recognizing that my kid does have neurodiversity. What do I do now? And it's, it's giving us like a um, step in our shoes hear our voices this is how we're seeing the world so we're educating them giving them support networks and giving them advice from people who who know us best so that's like ADHD New Zealand Autism New Zealand like everyone that we're working with in this coalition we're talking to them and saying if you could help this, these parents if you could help these teachers what would you say and they're giving us like stuff to do um, and our final workshop is the Change Makers Workshop. And it's about reaching out to other organizations, leaders and companies and saying, how can you implement these neurodiverse friendly ideas in your workplace? How are you neglecting your neurodiverse mm. employees in your workplace? And how can you harness their resources? Because we have so much to offer. We are limited. We are very limited when we're not in an environment that caters to our needs. It's like you're not watering our plant. How can you make us thrive? Yeah. So. Love it. Um, are the workshops run by you as young people yes. as well? Um, as a YNC champion, we're doing a lot of um, speaking um, this year, and so we're going to be running these workshops so you get our point of view. What's that like going into a corporate space? I think it's exciting. Yeah. A lot of us are very passionate, um, especially in Parliament. There was some <laughs> um, uh, very big emotions there, but... I think that it's still in learning and it's a bit of give and take. We're showing you our side and we're very open to you asking us everything you need to know. So if yeah. someone wants to be part of this cohort, what's involved in the application process? And I guess are you wanting people with a real mix of neurodiversity on that cohort or is it just put your hand up and apply please? Wide range of neurodiversity, yeah. right? We we want to make sure that what we're doing is representative. Again, because this space is so unknown for a lot of people, we recognise that uh, the widest range of thought, experience, background, upbringing, desires, wants for the world, career path, all of that stuff is really important for us because... This the understanding around neurodiversity is so slim. The more we can gather, the better in a position we're going to be to inflict real change in the world. Um, what's involved in applications? So applications close on Sunday the 17th, this Sunday, uh, 5 p.m. Very, very simple application process. Get some core details from you so that we can contact you. Um, we ask you basically what your biggest desire is, what's the change you want to make in the world in the space of neurodiversity, uh, and then ask them to either film a short 30 second video or write a short little one pager, depending on how you like to communicate, um, to share that with us. What is the one change that you would like to make as a young young champion, basically? Um, from there, it goes to the organisations. We put it through a bit of a selection process, uh, and then we'll have our champions locked in sort of by the end of March for this year. That is so cool. That is so cool. And you've got your big day out coming up in July in Wellington. Tell us a little bit about what, what's involved in the big day out. 
We do. So one thing we're doing this year, again, to kind of play on that piece of awareness, understanding, ensuring that everybody can, can understand what neurodiversity is and have a say at the table, uh, we've decided to take inspiration from Big Day Out, which obviously was such a pivotal moment of a lot of our childhoods and upbringings, uh, and create the neurodiversity Big Day Out. So this year we run as a one-day event in Wellington, uh, j- uh, end of July, I believe, and... Um, and it'll just be a day of celebration, lots of everything. We're going to have musicians there who are neurodiverse. We're going to have artists who are neurodiverse, filmmakers who are neurodiverse, actors, actresses, politicians, business owners, young people, educators, healthcare. We want wide uh, variation of what people do and who they are um, for two reasons. One, like I've mentioned, we need all voices at the table if we're going to want to make real change. And two, fundamentally, it's about showing young people that despite your experience in high school or intermediate or primary or any level of education, you can go on to do amazing things, Mm. right? We look at the world's famous. We look at the Richard Branson's dyslexia, Elon Musk, ADHD and autism. Mm. Um, Closer to home, you've got the likes of Benny. You've got um, Peter Beck. You've got Sir Ian Taylor. You know, you've got these big names. who have great role models. They've gone on to change the world. Mm. Um, But we need them and we need their voice speaking directly to young Mm. people to say, I know it's hard, right? I know the system is broken. Mm. Collectively, we can change it, but it won't happen overnight. Mm. This is a long process. It will take us years. But to be that face and voice of inspiration to go, okay, people like me can make this. I even just love the conversation around you, you know, having a Zoom and saying, hey, this happened in my class this week. And then go, so how do we deal with that when that next happens? Wouldn't it be cool if some teachers and education makers, change makers, were listening in on those Zooms? Um, You didn't come in for this purpose, but I'm curious to ask this question. You know, people listening to this show, you know, we're often talking about investing into property and real estate and things. If people wanted to invest in this organisation or support you, how do you need support when it comes to funding and fundraising? Mm. So... First and foremost, there is actually, surprisingly enough, for a charitable organisation, we have a net positive return on investment from a social value. So NZCGE alone, um, I know this from the work we've done with them, um, on average, every dollar invested into that organisation spits out $6.90, and when we scale our programmes, $7.20 of social value to the country. Brilliant. ROI of 7 to 1 for all you investors out there, (laughs) pretty darn good. Um, But how can they support the work we're doing? Um, ultimately, we're looking for organisations or individual philanthropic donors uh, who believe in the cause to get behind us and support it financially. Um, we are a charity. We started this with zero dollars. All funding has come from either myself, Justine, and a couple of other individuals and organisations who really believe in this work. Mm. Um, countless hours, tears, laughter, angry fights. Um <sighs> Lots of all of that, but uh, there's a few key ways. Like I said, we're doing a big research piece. We obviously need some some serious back for that. Um, we'll be working with all the major academics across the country to help support on that too. Um, we'll be looking for sponsors for the big day out, looking for um, one thing we're really looking for that would be amazing to have if there's any organisation listening who believes in this work and believes in the power of young people at the front leading this change. We are looking for a significant... Um, foundation partner to be our kind of key sponsor of YNC and the work mm. that these young people are doing um, and would love to partner with a Kiwi brand who, who really understands and believes in this mission. Yeah. yeah. All right. We'll get your contact details at the end. So if you're listening, and this is certainly an organisation to support. Um, you're both involved in the theatre world, and just a minute ago you mentioned, you know, all the for the big day out, all these musicians and creative people, artists. Yep. Is that a, a total coincidence, or do we find a lot of people with neurodiversity thrive well in the arts? There's something about being creative. Yeah, I, I, I don't think anything's a coincidence. <laughs> I think there is a big link between. Often, I find in the arts and the in the creative world, there is a little bit less rigid structure. There's a little bit more fluidity. And in general, there seems to be a little bit more acceptance yes, of difference, definitely. right? So Katie Rose will be able to speak to this, but um, my background in theatre, uh, you know, walking into a room, doesn't matter what you look like, who you are, mm-hmm. how you speak, what, you know, what colour your shoes are, doesn't matter, doesn't matter anything. You're there, you're going to have a good time. Mm-hmm. Uh, and in general, it's a pretty supportive environment. Um, so we yeah. need to get our 
education spaces and our workspaces into that same more theatrical same thing yeah yeah but that that supportive space yeah. is that how you found it for the arts um yes when, funny enough i was very very shy and timid as a little girl when i when i first got diagnosed i was petrified i would not speak to anyone new and the first thing my mum did was enroll me in a drama class so well that changed me <laughs> so and that's how i met a bunch of different people and it, it is you do find a community there and there is acceptance because you're all doing the same thing you're all putting yourself on the line it's very raw i think so no one's kind of there to make fun of you or make you feel stupid or make you feel any lesser for who you are so that's mm. i think that should be our take on neurodiversity as well Cool. We're nearly out of time, but a quick fire round now. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, often we look, when we're looking at statistics in particular in New Zealand, we look at it with a Maori and Pacific lens on it. Where does that sit in the neurodiversity world? Very little quantifiable data. <coughs> what we do know is, uh, in particular in the Maori culture, uh, neurodiversity is looked at very differently. Uh, it is not looked at as a difference or a bad thing or a negative. It is just looked at as you're a little bit different in a, in a completely non-judgmental way. And I think we see that a lot with the concept of Fano and bringing community together. Mm. We're all on the same journey together. It doesn't matter if you think a little bit different or you've got a little bit more energy than me or, you know, maybe you can't handle shiny lights and big sounds. Totally cool. We can accommodate. Like, we're all one big community. Mm. We're all one big family. That's, mm -hmm. it's, it's what you do for your, your brothers, your sisters, your mum, your dad. Why can't I do it for you too? Um, so while there's no like quantifiable data that we know of, and that's part of that research study that we really want to do, um, we do know that it's looked at very differently in that culture. Um, and something that I'm going to call us the Western world mm. uh, definitely should be taking inspiration and guidance from. Um, and it's something that we're committed to this year is partnering more with um, local Maori voice to really help us understand the Maori view on it all. Brilliant. Katie Rose, if you were Education Minister for the day... What would you do? What would you mandate change in this space? I would say yes to everything this coalition has to say. Ah. What a great world that would be. <laughs> that was an easy answer. That what was do you, really easy. What do you think um, we need to do to make people, and I'm guessing now perhaps more the older adults, not people at school, mm -hmm. but people who have perhaps got grandkids, etc. now, what can we do to make them understand neurodiversity better? I think it's very much having an open mind, especially when we're still learning this. It's quite difficult to find someone who knows it all or can, or can say this is what it is and give you these simple definitions. I think it's to always keep learning about the things that we're doing and um, the new findings, the new statistics that we're, um, that we're creating because they don't exist yet. Um, and it's about um, acceptance. Mm. A lot of it is about acceptance. Like... Creating an environment where everyone feels safe and you can learn to understand them better. I think that's... It's having a voice, isn't it? it and I guess it's a is. voice for those who consider themselves neurodiverse to feel safe to have the conversation, but also mm. for, say, the grandparents who don't quite understand it, to ask the questions, like I've just asked you tonight and you've answered so beautifully. <laughs> um, we're right out of time. Tell us, how can people get in touch and find out a little bit more and support you? Yeah, best place to go is neurodiversity.org.nz. That's kind of the home of everything we do. That's neurodiversity.org.nz. Nice and simple. Um, from there, you can find ways to join the YNC if you want to apply. Um, applications do close on Sunday, but there's plenty of time to get them in uh, this week. Um, and on there, you'll be able to find contact details for myself, Justine, all the other organisations. Uh, drop us an email, give us a phone call. Very, very open to having conversations with anybody and everybody who believes in this mission and wants mm -hmm. to get behind it in any way, shape, form, whether it's host a workshop, whether it's a financial mm. sponsorship, whether it's an in-kind thing. Um, you know, we've had everybody, we've had leadership and communication experts come in and do training with these guys on speaking in public or, yeah, um, you know, how to run better workshops. Anything you can do to get behind and support these these amazing young adults would be uh, greatly appreciated. Or invite these amazing young adults into your workspace. Yes. Come and talk. Even just come Please and talk do. to your staff. Yeah, 30 minutes. can be done over morning tea. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Um, thank you so much for coming in tonight. It's absolutely pleasure to have you thank here. You. I look forward thank to hearing you. where it goes. Um, you're both shining stars doing amazing work. He thinks he's old. He's so young. <laughs> like, what's he talking about? Um, fabulous to have you both here. Next week we are chatting to the Bay of Plenty team all about real estate and investing in that space. Check out our Facebook page this week, Property Matters Radio, so you can check out all the details on these guys, get their information. Have a wonderful week. We'll catch you next week. Good night. <laughs>